It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. They are CBS News correspondents Larry Lasseur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Right Reverend G. Bromley Oxnam, Bishop of the Methodist Church. There are some 21 million Christians in the world who call themselves Methodists. It is, in fact, the world's largest Protestant church. And our guest tonight is one of its most articulate leaders. And we're happy to have him here at this season. Bishop Oxman, do you think it can be said that there is a genuine resurgence of religion in this country? Well, Mr. Lasseur, that's a difficult question. Personally, I believe there is. I think it's evidence, for instance, in the statistics regarding church membership. There are many people who do not realize that membership was quite low in revolutionary days, I mean the American Revolution. There were only about 5% of the people belonged to the churches back in the days of the American Revolution. In 1850, 16%. In 1936 percent, in 1950, 57%, now 60. Now, if church membership means anything, I, I take it that there is evidence here of resurgence. The primary matter for us to have in mind, however, is that we don't determine religious significance by numbers. We deal with religious significance in terms of quality, and I'd like to have you check on that on your own. Bishop Oxnam, mm. we've heard a good deal these days about the prospects for unity among the many sects and churches of this country. How do you estimate the chances for unity today? Well, you use the term unity. There is unity at the moment. For instance, 33 of the great denominations of the United States, representing a membership of 35 millions, are together in cooperation in the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States. That is unity. Now, perhaps you had in mind organic union. If we are going to have union, that is, not separate denominations cooperating at the national level or at the world level as we have in the World Council of Churches, I think one of the principles we've got to insist upon is diversity in unity. In a word, we've got to conserve all the values of the many different searches for the eternal. And uh, we are learning to work and worship and witness together it's extraordinary what is going on. I haven't time at the moment to go into that in detail, but I think we're going to take our steps first by uniting the great families. By that I mean there were three major Methodist groups in the United States. We united them in 1939 to form the United the Methodist Church. Uh, similarly, other unions have occurred. When we get these families together, uh, then I think somebody's going to bridge the gulf Maybe the Methodist Church and the Episcopal Church, for instance. Our Episcopalian friends will not uh, think that I'm holding them to this at the moment, but there's good reason for that. And after we've broken down these barriers that separate the different families, maybe someday the Protestants and the great Orthodox churches will consider the wisdom of being together. And personally, I hope the day will come when all of us will be Christian enough, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant to kneel at a common altar and ask God to forgive us for our divisions and join hands. There's good reason to be together in a day when our faith is challenged. Bishop Oxen, uh, speaking of unity, do you think that the churches of this country are doing enough to uh, uh, play a progressive role in the integration of our races in this country, the white and colored races? Mr. Sir, you know how to ask embarrassing questions. Now, it's, this is one place where I find it difficult to answer. Personally, I don't like to have uh, the churches taught their Christianity by the Brooklyn Dodgers. We should have been teaching our Christianity, not in terms of talking about our Father who art in heaven and therefore we're brothers, but in concrete application of that principle. I think Branch Rickey in bringing Jackie Robinson in did more concretely than much of what we have been doing. Now there's a tremendous amount going on that I haven't time to recount and I'm proud of that. But I sincerely trust the church will not be the last institution to move into the real expression of its faith and do away with segregation in every form. At the moment, we're all on record as opposed to segregation in fact. Those are the statements. But when it comes to the actual practice of it, I'm afraid, Mr. Lesseur, that we're yet remiss, although we are making progress that I'd be proud to recite if there were time. Well, Bishop Oxen, incidentally, how do you feel about this new and uh, simple approach to religion, a reassurance of 
positive thinking. Well, of course, there's value in positive thinking. There's value, I suppose, in uh, any faith that enables a man to move out in strength toward the future. But I think there's danger here that we may identify Christianity with the cult of success and assume that because a man is a Christian, therefore he must be successful, let us say, in monetary terms or in terms of the uh, occupation he happens to hold. There seems to be an assumption if you just think positively, you're going to be president of the company tomorrow morning. Well, there just uh, aren't enough openings along that line. And I mustn't forget the fact that Christianity is a religion grounded in love, that at its heart is the symbol of the cross, that we move out in terms of sacrifice, that people are transformed as we spend our lives for others. And while that isn't denied in positive thinking, there's a certain uh, emphasis here that I think needs to be watched very, very carefully. Bishop Oxnum, on another subject, I'd like to ask you, what is the official attitude of the Protestant churches on the subject of the atomic bomb? Well, there is no official attitude of Protestant churches upon any subject because one of the traditions of the whole Protestant movement is the right of private judgment. We believe that the individual must be free to make up his own mind. Now, having said that, official action has been taken by democratic bodies representing certain of the Protestant churches. The World Council of Churches itself, which is a body now of 167 churches representing a membership of perhaps 200 millions, representing perhaps most of the non-Roman uh, Christian world. There are notable exceptions to that. Uh, this body has taken action uh, recognizing the situation that you now face uh, in world affairs, but nevertheless seeing in the hydrogen bomb a fundamental moral challenge that has to be faced and has taken the position, first of all, that we will not use it ourselves in any aggressive way. That if we are attacked by those who use the atomic bomb, we will work through the United Nations in terms of what is now called collective security. And I realize there's something of a problem there. Generally, the churches are of the opinion that we now have a weapon that enables us, well, I don't like that word enable, that moves toward murder and eventual suicide, and that so there's something morally wrong in the use of a weapon that really destroys humanity. When God created the earth, the, the story was that man was to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. He wasn't supposed to destroy it. There's something here that cuts across a fundamental purpose. We're opposed to the use of these tremendous weapons, though we recognize in the world in which we now live, there may be times when if we faced attack by such weapons, we might do the immoral thing from one point of view and perhaps the necessary thing from another. To well, defend Bishop Oxen, speaking of the uh, present day challenges and the ch challenge of the superior numbers of communist manpower, what are the objections of the Protestant Church to universal military training? Well, it's very difficult to answer that question in just a word. There are certain basic objections, and most of our churches are on record as opposed to compulsory universal military training. Of course, there's a new reserve system now. Do you? I know, but there is no difference really from the standpoint of the compulsory aspect of it. There are 100,000 men who may volunteer, but down underneath it, the whole thing is based upon compulsion, and that's the basic objection of the church. We feel that somehow we are writing into American life upon a permanent basis a program of compulsory universal military training. We're opposed to it from this point of view that I think is significant. We don't like to see our youth brought to an authoritarian system in which you find the basic principle is absolute obedience. Somehow that conditions a man in such a fashion that we think democracy is going to be jeopardized. I mean, when you think of the free man and the free society seeking the truth that frees the creative individual, uh, we feel educationally there's something unsound here. There are many other reasons. I don't know whether you want well, me to go into the... Sir, in this day and age, do you believe that we can afford uh, not to have a permanent military reserve program? I didn't say that we were not to have a permanent military... I mean, a military reserve program. We have in selective service an emergency situation developed to meet an emergency which ends when the emergency ends. And that emergency may run for a long time, I grant you. Our objection is the writing of this permanently into the real life of the United States of America. That's what we're doing. And we don't believe it's good national defense. I believe in a strong national defense. But I don't believe it can be shown here that this is really good national defense. 
you draw fast sums that could be much better used, I think, uh, for uh, uh, research, uh, for the development of a, of a professional army, uh, for proper weapons and the like. I'm trying to summarize this too much, but I, it's, take for instance the Air Force. They're not calling for this, nor is the Navy, nor, is, nor are the United States Marines. There's something here that we need to think about. I don't think it's good national defense, and it gives you a false sense of security when you get these large numbers of men. You think you've got something. I don't think you can train a soldier in six months. The Air Force needs four years, and I think we'd be much better off to have a highly trained professional army and build your reserves out of a selective service system on the basis of an emergency. But that's all too brief. I, I haven't stated the case. In other words, you feel that we would be establishing a tradition in this country which you would not approve of. I want to thank you very much, Bishop uh, Oxham, for coming here tonight at this season when, of course, we all think of peace. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest was the Right Reverend G. Bromley Oxnam, Bishop of the Methodist Church. Longines has perfected, after 20 years of development, what are regarded as the world's most advanced automatic watches. The exclusive self-winding mechanism is fabricated with a perfection which represents a new triumph for Longines craftsmanship. Now here are facts that you should know. An automatic watch is wound by the movement of a pendulum or a rotor. This diagram represents the winding rotor of many automatic watches. See how it moves only in part of a circle. This diagram represents the Longines automatic. It has a full swing, 360 degree winding rotor. Every movement of the wrist produces winding action. Design, however, is only the beginning of the Longines automatic. What makes a Longines watch so superlatively fine is the unsurpassed perfection of the Longines manufacture, which has won for Longines Ten World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. And if finest quality is your first consideration, then whatever your needs in a watch, whatever the style, whatever the purpose, Longines has made it for you. For every Longines watch will demonstrate in full measure the greater accuracy and complete reliability which made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor.